Welcome. Uh, my name is Roger Berkowitz, and I'm the founder and academic director here at the Hannah Arendt Center at Bard College. I'm thrilled to welcome you to the virtual reading group. Uh, today, we are continuing to read Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition. Uh, for many people, her most theoretically uh, advanced and ambitious and important work. Um, uh, for some people, it's, it's her, her most relevant work today. Um, why? Uh, well, I, it is, uh, about, well, what, let's talk about it. It's about the human condition and, um, the question that she has framed for herself is, uh, um, we have to think what we are doing and what are we doing? Um, we are, uh, as we always do, and let's be very clear about that, as we always do in the process of transforming the human condition, because the human, we humans live in a world, a human created world. And as such, we live in a world conditioned not only by nature, uh, but also by what we make and do. Um, and uh, one aspect of that humanly uh, created world, um, uh, is that um, uh, we also make a political world. Uh, and, and so um, we live in, in this world of, of politics. Um, and politics has been uh, part of the human world uh, for a long time. Uh, and I don't want to say only since the Greeks, but um, at least since the Greeks. Um, and uh, what Arendt is doing in this section is saying there's something uh, that's changing about the human condition and has been for a long time, right? This is not related to technology like automation and it's not related to the atom bomb. The, 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 the changes that she's talking about in this chapter uh, are, are, are much, uh, go all the way back to the Romans, right? Um, and it's about the loss of a strong distinction between what she's going to call the public sphere and the private sphere. Um, and uh, for her, uh, this distinction, which has been being challenged since it was formulated, and certainly since the Romans, um, I, is important, not because it was ever absolute, it never was, and, and not because, um, uh, oh my God, we need to stop it. No, that's not her point. Her point is that there was certain things that the distinction um, uh, made possible. And two of those were a particular understanding of freedom and equality. And uh, so, so the blurring of this distinction between the public and the private, and with it, the addition of the social, um, means that the, uh, the, the way we've understood freedom, the reality of freedom and equality, as they at least have been understood at times within a certain tradition, um, are increasingly uh, imperiled, uh, and, and, and more difficult to actualize. Um, again, there is no claim in here that we need to go back to those old ideas of freedom and equality, right? The claim is to think what we are doing. Um, with that little introduction, let me say that even though this chapter is called uh, the public and the private realm, I think most of you will have figured out that it's actually um, about three realms, uh, the public, the private, and the social. Um, the social is a realm that she imagines uh, largely um, uh, was largely ignored by the Greeks, um, but became more and more uh, uh, important and, uh, and, 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 and had a bigger role in, our, in the human condition and the human life with the Romans, 
and then um, certainly more in Christianity and the medieval world, uh, and then in the uh, rise of the, the world of nation states and the modern economy. Um, and so what she's going to do in, in, this, in this chapter on the public and private is lay out the importance of the difference between these worlds, articulate what each world in its sort of clarity is about, each realm, the public, the private, and the social, and then um, explain why the blurring of it is consequential. Um, uh, so just to outline the chapter so that you understand it, the two sections we're reading today, sections four and five, um, are sort of looking at um, the consequence of uh, the old Greek uh, division between the polis and the household or the public and the private. Um, and, uh, and then after that, you have three chapters, right? One on the social, uh, one on uh, the, uh, the public realm, and then one on the private realm. And after that, uh, we have uh, a few concluding chapters that, that raise some problems on it. But that's the, the structure of, of this chapter. Um, so we start with section four, right? Uh, uh, which uh, on page 22, and this is called man, a social or political animal. Um, the point of this chapter, um, uh, you know, is to say that there has been, well, okay, the point is to highlight what she calls the bios politicos, the bios politicos, um, the, 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 the life of politics, which is a term of, of Aristotle's, as a, as a distinct realm and way, distinct way of human life. So when she says man, a social or political animal, she's referring to Aristotle and to the bios politicos, that the, the Aristotle's definition of man, or one of them, as a political animal, as a um, zoon politikon, uh, a zoon, uh, an animal uh, that is political. Um, what at the core of this um, distinct realm of the political realm, as Aristotle understood it, according to Hannah Arendt, um, is that people in this realm of politics pursue freedom, not necessity. So they pursue, they seek to live freely, which means they are not governed by needs like of life. So food or housing or, or things like that. Um, so what do they actually care about, right? Um, this is a, a question that many people have asked Hannah Arendt and we've discussed before, but they care about what it means to live together and build a common world. What is a world? A world is something that lasts and that we share. And if it's going to last and we, sh and we share it, it must be something that attracts us it must be something exceptional about it that, that pulls us to live in it. And thus it must be beautiful of some sort or great. And so freedom in the political sphere, as opposed to necessity, is the doing of things that need to be seen, right? This is the distinction. So to have one distinction of the bios politicos, the political realm, is freedom, not necessity. Another distinction is that it concerns things that need to be seen, not things that need to be hidden, right? So this is how she'll distinguish it later. Um, the private realm concerns things that need to be hidden. The realm of politics is a realm where you do things that you want people to see. You say things and do things that are worthy of being seen and talked about. This realm, not only is it freedom versus necessity and things that need to be seen versus things that need to be hidden, it's also a realm of plurality versus a realm of oneness or a domination. And you need a plurality in this realm because if you want to um, 
act in such a way that uh, you're free and do things that will be seen. You need other people who will see and talk about um, what, you, what you do. And then finally, um, it's a realm of action and speech, not a realm of violence, right? So these four distinctions that I've dead, freedom versus necessity, things that need to be seen versus things that are need to be hidden, plurality versus um, oneness, and action and speech versus violence are the four sort of um, characteristics of the bios politicos uh, that, that we're going to explore in, in this chapter. Um, the, the chapter begins as, in, as its title suggests, man, a social or political animal, um, with this distinction between political and, and social. Now, again, the chapter is called private, politic, public and private. So where does this social come from? Um, in, in a very, I think, uh, Arendtian approach or move, um, it comes from a mistranslation, right? So the, the Romans um, translated the Aristotelian definition of man, zoon politikon, um, with the uh, with the world with the with the phrase um, uh, animal socialis or social animal and and there's a way in which I mean I think we can all see that social and political are in common have something in common they're both about man mankind as she says to talk about all of humanity um, uh, living not alone, living uh, with others in common. Um, and she begins actually in the first few sentences of this chapter um, by saying that the vita activa, the realm of action, the world, the life of action um, is rooted in a world of, of man-made things, um, including a polis, uh, so it's not natural. Um, and in this world of man-made things in the polis, the the one, uh, one aspect of the vita activa that really is deeply rooted in the public realm is action. Labor can be done alone, work can be done alone, but, but action can only be done amongst other people in plurality. Um, and so if you think of that, right, man could either be social or political because both social and political seem to imply this sense of other people around. But Arendt wants to say, no, um, this translation is a mistranslation. Uh, the, the, the Latin, and, and, and it, it, it embodies, she argues, a loss of Greek, a loss of the Greek understanding of the of politics and of the public realm. So societis, society, or the social, in Latin was originally a group or a society or an alliance between people. So it's just a multitude of people that comes together around common interests. Um, and so how is that different? It's a kind of mere social companionship. Um, but she says, uh, for the Greeks, social companionship that we live with other people is not human, is not distinctly human. It's what animals do too. Lots of animals live in herds or, or colonies or, or, other, or other kind of social groups. So how is it different for the Greeks. Um, and Arendt's uh, answer, or is well, begins her answer by saying that the bios politicos, or the polis, or politics, uh, was developed in sharp distinction from the social or merely communal life um, of what is one's own. And so we need to understand uh, more about this difference between uh, po politics and social. Um, for Arendt, the rise of the polis so the polis is this uniquely Greek form of a city state, um, means that man is born again. So not Christianity, but born again into the political realm. He receives a second life, what she calls, and what Aristotle calls a bios politicos. Thus, every citizen for the Greeks um, belongs to two different orders of existence. On the one hand, what is one's own, the idion or the oikia, the uh, just so we know, oikia is the um, uh, Greek word for house or household. Uh, it's also the root of our word 
economics, and there's going to be a lot of talk about economics in, in this chapter, uh, this section and this chapter. Um, and so on one hand, we all live in an economic realm, in a realm um, where we concern ourselves and our needs and our family and even our friends. Uh, and on the other hand, we live in a world that is common as political, not as social, where we are concerned not with our needs, but with building a world that is worthy of lasting, right? That's the, that's the sort of distinction that Arendt wants to, to make here. Um, as a result, this polis, which is about the building of a world worthy of lasting, organizes man on this, on, on, on this level of freedom, separate from necessity, and thus one that depends upon the destruction or at least the suppression of um, family life uh, and organized kinship units as the dominant mode of organization in society. Um, and she goes through a little bit in these long footnotes uh, in, in, in chapter four, I mean, section four, I'm sorry, on, um, on, on the history of the uh, antagonistic forms of government between the, 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 the cult or the private family uh, uh, hereditary government and um, the polis as it emerges in, in ancient Greece. Um, within the polis, as it emerges as this realm not concerned with needs, but concerned with um, the uh, lasting production of a common world, uh, we need to um, speak and act in that world in ways that um, uh, strike others as meaningful so that we gather together into a political community. Uh, and that is why um, speak and act, speech and action, she says, are the quintessential political communities. Um, only in a polis, only in a political realm or a public realm can different men spend their whole lives in the political realm in action and speech. That's on page 25. And so um, she, she cites uh, Homer's uh, uh, line about Achilles, the doer, which calls him the doer of great deeds and the speaker of great words. And she cites the end of Sophocles' play Antigone, uh, in which, um, in a somewhat controversial translation, um, she renders it, but great words paying back the great blows of the overproud teach understanding in old age. Um, she's relying here on Holderlin's translation, uh, very much so, uh, of the Sophocles. Um, I, we can go into it in Q&A if you want. I'm not going to uh, uh, spend much more time on it, on, on it now. Um, in political thinking uh, and in politics, um, action is actually subordinated to speech. And so um, even though speech and action are what she says are, are the activity of the public realm that presupposes plurality, it's actually speech that comes over time to be um, the uh, the dominant uh, uh, activity of politics, um, which is why she calls the polis um, the most talkative of all political bodies or bodies politics. Uh, and, and she says that the Greeks talked of the politician as the rhetor, the speaker. Um, this is important in, in her work here, but also later in her work in the 60s, um, because the, the, the focus on, on, on politics uh, as a matter of speech is opposed to the idea of politics as a matter of violence. Um, she says on page 27, to force people by violence um, to command rather than to persuade were pre-political ways to deal with the people, with people characteristic of the life outside of the polis. In the polis, in freedom, in a public realm, uh, people persuade each other through speeches. They don't command 
and they don't uh, uh, compel through violence or force through violence. So um, that's how uh, um, uh, chapter of section four uh, ends. And, and then she moves into section five called the polis and the household. Now, this is a, a, a really exciting and yet problematic uh, and, and provocative chapter. And it's one that um, has caused a lot of uh, discussion and worry because of the discussion of slavery. And so I just want to point that out. We're going to talk about it. Um, uh, and I just want to us to be very aware and, and, and clear about what she is and isn't saying about slavery. Um, so the polis and the household is a way of making this distinction that we've talked about between the public and the private. Um, it's an old distinction, she says. Now, just as we talked about with the Romans, um, it is a distinction that almost as soon as it was made began to be blurred. So we've seen, she says, the emergence of a distinctly social realm, neither public nor private, um, that coincides with the emergence of the modern age with its political form in the nation state. So the Romans already translated it with social, but still somewhat um, saw it as political. But in the modern age, which we've talked about, began with the scientific revolution uh, for her, it also begins with the rise of the nation state. Why? A nation state, and this is something she talks a lot about in her book, Origins of Totalitarianism. A nation state is a hybrid body. It's a nation and it's a state. And these two things for her are not only different, they're contradictory. A nation is like a family. It's, it's uh, like they, there's, the, there's the Jewish nation or, 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 or um, different ethnic nations or, or religious nations. It's, it's, it, it has a kind of um, uh, uh, organic and ethnic unity to it. Um, and so in a nation state, for example, to take one, Germany uh, or, or, or Czechoslovakia is an easy example, uh, which used to exist. I know it doesn't exist anymore. Um, you had um, different peoples, different nations in the nation state. And yet one nation, the Czechs, were the dominant nation. Same in Germany, she said. There were different nations in Germany. There are the Jews, the, the Roma, and others. But one nation, um, the Germans, you know, whatever they are problematically, um, was, was the dominant nation. And, in any, and, and, and so the nation corresponds to sort of the fact that in a nation state, we want to pursue our national identity. And yet, since a state is a legal constitutional entity that allows different people from different nations to come together and be treated equally in public, the state and the nation are at odds with one another. Um, that's a very important part of her book, The Origins of Totalitarianism. In this book, it's important because the rise of the nation state um, is is, is another way of talking about the rise of the social as the national family. And the idea that our nation is supposed to be some sort of coherent group of people with a national character, right? Um, so in the 1950s and 60s, one of the things Arendt really respected about the United States was that it, she thought it was not a nation state. By the late 60s and 70s, she's worrying that it's becoming a nation state, that it has a national character that is supposed to, everyone is supposed to assimilate to. But for her, the, the, the sort of brilliance of the nation state as someone who came in the 1940s as a Jew was that there wasn't like a single national character that you had to assimilate to. Um, and so this rise of the nation state is a part of the rise of this idea of the social. Um, she talks about the need to understand the device, decisive division, this is on page 28, between the public and the private realms, between the sphere of the polis and the sphere of the household and family, and finally, between the activities related to the common world and those related to the maintenance of life. I think I've explained that well enough at this point. Um, we can come back to it in Q&A. Um, 
Moving on to 29, page 29, she wants to say that this decisive deficit division between the public and private is blurred in the modern age, not only by the emergence of the nation state, but also now by the emergence of national economy. What is a national economy? It's called in German Volkswirtschaft, um, the, 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 the economy of the people, the Volk, the nation. Um, but the idea is that each nation is supposed to have an economy that they're supposed to um, uh, uh, administer in such a way as to take care of people. Um, uh, uh, Foucault talks about this as the move from a government based on kingship to a government based on shepherding, the idea of a shepherd that takes care of the flock. Whereas the king governs the flock, the shepherd cares for the flock. And um, her argument is that the national economy and the nation state, we now have to care for people and for the citizens in such a way that we start to see them not as uh, you know, equals to, to speak and act in public, but as part of a family that we all care for. Um, as a result, the decisive distinctions between the public and the private begin to um, um, uh, disappear. Um, on the one hand, um, we lose this idea of privacy. We lose this idea that we have certain sacred uh, a sacred gods in our house or the, earth, the hearth in our house, which is protected from the public. Now the public wants to regulate even what we do in our houses in order to keep us safe, right? We, we, we lose that sort of private realm. On the other hand, uh, we begin to lose um, the, the sort of distinctness of the, pri of the public realm, um, uh, this realm of, of, of freedom. Uh, for her, the realm of the polis, on the contrary, was the sphere of freedom on page 30. And on 31, freedom is exclusively located in the political realm. Um, but what we begin to see is that this political realm is based on a pre-political violence. Um, uh, and that this pre-political violence is what allows us to liberate ourselves from necessity, which causes inequality. And so... Um, uh, the polis, while it is only a realm of equals, uh, depends upon a, private, a, pri a, a prior inequality so that other people through force and violence can be made to work for me. So I don't need to uh, uh, take care of my necessities and I can live freely in the public realm. Um, and this... Uh, this um, the, the, the blurring of these distinctions um, uh, is part of the modern world, not only the modern world of the nation state, um, uh, not only uh, the modern world of, of science, but also the modern world of administration and of uh, national economy. And here's where um, slavery uh, emerges for Hannah Arendt, right? Because slavery, in the ancient world, um, was the was were, were primarily the slaves were people of your own nation, but they were people who you'd beat in battle for the most part or in war, and thus violence and force are justified in Greeks, as, in the private household because they are the only means to master necessity, to rule over the slave and to become free. We create slaves. We create those who through violence and force we rule in our private realms, in our household. And she includes, not she includes, the Greeks include women, children, and slaves. Um, and these women, children, and slaves do the work um, uh, that allow citizens, um, some of the men, um, to free themselves from necessity and uh, liberate themselves for life of freedom in the public world. Um, so the question that I think Arendt's chap section here and her discussion here raises, right? And this is, I think, the, the, the question that we need to talk about is, are freedom and equality dependent on a pre-political force? 
Um, the Greeks say that freedom and equality um, are dependent on a pre-political force. You can't have freedom and equality without a pre-political force that leads to inequality. So there is no freedom and equality without inequality. Um, she talks about how in Sparta at one point, one observer says that in the, in the Agora, there were 60 free, free citizens and 4,000 unfree persons. You needed all these unfree people in order to allow the freedom of a small group. Um, another uh, change in the modern world is that social economy is now a collective concern. So I think the question that her, that her text is raising is, so on the one hand, she's saying, let's understand the Greek conceptualization of the difference between the public and the private and also the social. Let's understand that the idea of freedom and equality as the Greeks understood it depended to a large degree on that distinction and on a pre-political violence. In our world in which we don't see freedom and equality in the same way, we don't accept that freedom and equality should be based on a pre-political violence. Um, what does that mean? How do we think uh, uh, what we are doing. Um, and, and that is, uh, I take it to be how she sets up um, the chapter two, uh, the public and private realm in these first two sections. So um, I will stop there and um, uh, let's get a discussion going. Uh, Susan Wright. Yep. Hi, Roger. Can you hear me? Hi. Yeah, I'm just going to turn my volume up a little bit. But yes. Okay, good. Okay. Um, two questions. The first one came in the first section that you were talking about when she says, we need to speak out in meaningful ways. I, she refers to that, she uses that word quite a bit. And I, and I wonder if you have any thoughts on, or did she ever define that more specifically? What, what is a meaningful way or act for her? Yeah, that was my first question. And then just the second one, which you just left off with was um, this idea that you, it, it sounds like she's saying, or at least the Greeks thought that it, basically everyone could not be free. You had to have some people who are not free so that you could be free. So just maybe some thoughts around that as well, because yes, for us in living in this day and age, we're like, eh, no, <laughs> why does that have to be? That's what we're fighting about, right? Or fighting against, so to speak. But right. those are my, those are my, my, my two comments or for, for your comments. Great. Yeah, so both, both excellent, Susan. Um, you know, uh, I think when I, about 10 years ago when I was, I would call myself just sort of becoming someone who really knew something about Hannah Arendt. Um, I used to say, you know, people say, well, why is Hannah Arendt important? And I would say the answer was freedom, right? That, that Hannah Arendt um, is really the thinker of freedom. And, I don't, and, 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 and let me say, there's a lot of ways in which that's true, but I've, I've come to revise my own uh, view on the answer to like, what's the core thought or the core that drives Hannah Arendt? And I think it's not freedom. I think it's meaning, right? So this, this is an attempt to, to raise your, your question. Yeah. Um, uh, it, she says in, in the origins in chapter nine, um, when she's talking about the right to have rights, um, that uh, you know, what makes us human is not to be alive because lots of other species are alive. And it is deeply human to die and even to die well. Um, and so it's not, she says, a human right is to live. Um, uh, and she's very critical of the human rights movement for a number of reasons, including that she thinks things that, that, that the human rights world thinks that life or food or, 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 or economic equality are human rights. She doesn't think they are. She thinks they're civil rights or other rights, but not human rights. And she says the one human right, which she calls the right to have rights, is the right to speak and act in public in ways that matter. Um, uh, and what she means by that 
is that to be human is to have the right to be seen and heard in public in a political community such that people can hear you and your voice and your uniqueness and your what makes you you and to put that into the world is what makes you human and that's the meaningfulness and so um freedom is also something human i don't think all other species have freedom but the freedom is is i think is important but what freedom really offers is when we're free and we can act and speak in public it allows us to be meaningful so i mean to just so go back to my revision freedom and meaningfulness i think go together um but the, the real um, aspiration of human life is, is for Hannah Arendt, as far as I understand it, is meaningfulness. Um, and so um, uh, when she's talking about the public realm, I, I don't think it's an accident that the two things she talks most about are freedom and meaning. Um, and so that's- so, so meaning is really, meaning is the ability to speak. It's not the specifics of what you're saying. No, I would say freedom so is much. more, I would say freedom is more the, the the capacity um uh the faculty to speak and act what it aims at you know one of the problems with our end is people say oh well she says freedom is like this faculty you know to be to to, to, to speak and act and what does it aim at freedom it's like a circle yeah. and in some way that's okay but what it aims at is to be meaningful to have people to be able to be heard and seen um okay. uh and she talks a lot about this actually in, in, in her book um, uh, on revolution uh, mm -hmm. in, the, in the section where she talks about um, there's a deep human urge to be seen and to be heard. And it comes up in a lot of her books. Uh, but I, I, I've come to think that that and, and even and in the life of the mind, too, she, she, she actually says that there's, you know, like certain species like butterflies have certain beautiful markings because there's a there's a there's a deep life animalistic urge to be seen and heard which could make it suggest that that's not human it's more animalistic um uh but to be seen and heard for your speaking and action for who you are as a as a speaking and acting being uh is i think human um on your other question about um you know whether freedom uh, it means something that is something that not everybody can have and equality is not everything something everything can have uh, you know I don't I don't think she would say that um, uh, I think she would say that the Greeks, the Greeks developed their idea of freedom hmm. uh, based on the presupposition of um, a pre-political uh, inequality and violence and that for, and that they didn't there was no other way to free them from necessity in order that they could be free in 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 public life um you know i think one of the things that we will we'll read about it as we get into this book but one of the questions that she raises is you know does the rise of technology and robots uh and um and other and administration do these uh, allow us um, uh, to um, create a world in which um, everyone has the uh, uh, capacity to be enough freed enough from necessity uh, that they could um, be free? I think she's skeptical of that to some degree, uh, but 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 I think I think it's a mistake to say oh well therefore she says we should justify inequality um i don't think that's her claim I, I i don't think she thinks um all inequality is 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 completely unjustified um and we can we'll we'll have to talk about that but she certainly i think i mean i i i i 100 positive thinks she thinks slavery is unjustified uh in the modern in the modern uh world um uh so um you know, uh, I think it becomes somewhat of a technical question 
on the one hand of whether we have enough technology that people can be freed from necessity enough to, to engage in politics. Um, but it's also uh, then a, a question of, of, of human nature. Do people want to be? So just to give you one example, in, in the book on revolution, right, where I think she talks about this more clearly than anywhere else, um, she will say that uh, um, when people came to the United States in the early 19th century, so 1800s, um, they were sort of shocked at how there was not a political division between the rich and the poor. Um, uh, in the sense that uh, both the rich and the poor would go to town hall meetings, et cetera. What she then says is what they didn't talk about was the complete political evisceration of, of slaves, Native Americans, and women. Um, and she said that in America in the 19th century, there was a kind of overcoming of the um, financial, uh, as long as people weren't miserable, but were poor, they weren't invisible. They could still be meaningful. They could still live in the public world. Hmm. Um, the problem was that with slaves, Native Americans, and women, they were even excluded, um, not on an economic basis only, but on a different basis, right? And, 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 and so that was the, um, that was sort of the inequality that was the pre-political violence that made um, freedom and equality possible. I, you know, I don't, I personally don't know where she ever talks about, you know, to what extent that's possible today, um, whether we could get rid of all inequality. Um, to me, that's, uh, a, you know, she, I think, in a, in a conference in Toronto in 1974, when she's asked a question sort of along these lines, she says, that's a technical question. <laughs> um, you know, I think it's, I think for her, it is, it's a question of technology. It's a question of, do we have enough technology to produce enough so that we don't need the pre-political violence? Um, and it's also a, a, a question of whether we can, um, uh, you know, morally, uh, uh, create a world in which we see everyone is free and equal. Um, I think that's her goal, but I don't think, um, uh, but I don't know, you know, I don't know how or when she thought it would, might happen. I don't have an answer to that. Um, uh, thank you, thank you, you Roger. Know. May I add oh. something? Yeah, uh, who said that? Clara from Hi, Colombia. Clara. Hi, how are you, Professor Roger? Um, I would like to uh, add something to your uh, reply uh, about the first question. And I would say that uh, one of the things, I, I, I totally agree with you with a saying in stating that Hannah Arendt is the thinker of meaning and freedom. I think it's, it's a great conclusion. And I will also say that, but I would say that the meaning has to do with the separation that he makes between knowledge and understanding, and then with the, the, the priority that he gave to um, meaning, to understand in terms of searching for a meaning. And she says in various texts, I'm not interested in knowing, knowing it's for the scientific people. I am really interested in um, understanding, in find meaning. And the other thing is that meaning also has to do with her um, approach to the world in terms of a phenomenon. The world, the public world, the common world, the human world, the artifice, artificial world is given to us in perspectives, all, always in perspective. And that has to be with that approach as a phenomenon. And is, if, the, if the world is given in perspective, you have to find your own meaning that you would complete, you would make a whole sense when you go into the political realm, when you go into that uh, space of freedom and you start to sharing all those perspectives, all those meanings, and you make like a, a, um, um, 
an entirely or a plural meaning that makes more sense. Yes, I will say yeah. more, more common sense. That's that's what I will add, Professor. Great. Thank you, Clara. I'll, I'll only add one other. I mean, I think that's a great comment. You know, you've made a connection between meaning, understanding, right? Um, and another, I'd say the third word that she would um, that she would include along this triad of meaning and understanding is reconciliation. For um, sure, definitely. And so, uh, and, and also non-reconciliation, that, that we have to learn to love the world and also at times um, there may be limits to our ability to love the world. And at those moments, we may have to uh, publicly enact a non-reconciliation with the world, uh, which is to say that to make the world meaningful, we actually have to reject it as it is now in some way. And um, she, she, she draws this distinction uh, in a number of her essays in the 1950s between meaning, understanding, and, and reconciliation. Um, and so I think if you're interested in that aspect of her work, they all need to be included. Um, Roger, Roger, may I get in, please? Uh, yeah, Cause Bill. Because this is not gonna work. It's not gonna work. <laughs> I asked you last week, uh, when we start this section, that you do something similar to what people are doing now with Native American people and land acknowledgement. Uh, you brushed me off. You said, no, that you're not, you're, the decolonization experience is something at academic in the university. It's out of your purview. I thought, because right now I am really confused and quite frankly, getting pissed. Are we talking about Hannah Arendt? Or are we talking about the Greeks? I thought that you should have framed this talking about this book now by saying that we realize now that Hannah Arendt's view of the world was shaped by a view of the world that was lacking in that it actually allowed a view of the world where there were huge swaths of people who were actually enslaved. And that we should read the book knowing that we're reading it in the saying that you're sitting up there on state stolen uh, Native American lands. I'm sitting here. We all know this country is built on stolen lands. Can we not say all of our philosophy, our studies are based on racist, exclusionary notions, even from some of our best thinkers like Har Harry Arendt. That's all I'm saying right yeah. now. I, cause it, I would make people like me relax if we had that understanding that th this is not um, Freedom does not really exist in this country and never has. Did okay. Hannah Arendt think it yeah. did? And meaning is one thing. What did people think? Now, this is a low blow. You're going into the crematorium and you're talking about, let's talk about the meaning of what's happening to us right now. Right. Well, well okay, now that's all I have to say, Roger. We should have acknowledged that we are, there's something about any discourse now that claims to be looking for a high ground, what are the basic truths? Mm -hmm. Freedom has not existed in this country. Hannah right. Arendt was also a victim of that short-sightedness. If we could say that before we start these discussions, they wouldn't seem so limp. Well, Bill, okay, I, I appreciate that. I, I did start- well, What does it mean to appreciate it, Roger? Okay, okay. Roger. I, I, don't, I did start by saying that we were gonna have a, a discussion about um, slavery. slavery? No, we're not talking about slavery. We're talking about across the board. This country was based on oppressiveness okay. of a huge swaths of people. Uh, and I and I think I've said that. Um, this and discussion that we're having, Roger, is predicated on something that is a huge lack. Let's acknowledge that we're in this conversation is a faulty conversation. Yeah, we I cannot think... have what we're trying to do. No, I think unless I... we acknowledge the fault. No, sorry, I, I'm yelling. I'm sorry. I'll get off. I, I, I no, stay on. I hope. Um, I hear so you, I, I, Roger. How do you and I talk? What, what I don't want to. I, you, you've heard what I'm saying. Yeah, I've heard. I want. Thing, and I want to. I'm trying to. The group. I want you to say to this group. We have to realize every time we talk about principles like freedom and so on that we're talking about it from a point of view of a country that was based on the absolute lack of it. Why couldn't we say that in the first time? And that Hannah Arendt is a product of that. So let me, can I, let me, let me say, I, 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 I hear what you're saying. 
I don't think it's based in a country that's based on the absolute lack of it. I think it's based in a country that's problematic. I think that there was some ways in which this country uh, was one of the most free countries in the world. And I think there's some ways in which it was one of the most horrific and criminal countries in the world. And uh, to my mind, we have to be able to say both those things. Um, we have to, the one truth doesn't nullify the other truth. There are truth in this case about freedom of this country is incredibly complicated. On the one hand, there was an ideal of freedom in the public sphere and of public life and democracy in this country that was at the beginning unheard of in the world and unique and uh, truly revolutionary. On the other hand, the country was based on slavery and, ex and, and exclusions and, and, and genocide uh, in ways that uh, were truly horrific. And- um, Roger, you're digging a hole. I don't how think I am. How does white supremacy fit into even what you're trying to say? Well, I'm not how sure. How does systemic racism fit into what you're trying to say? Bullshit, bullshit, bullshit. Okay. Well, I, I you know- sorry, Professor Roger. No, it's sorry, okay. Let me, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me say something. This is really, I mean, it's like the third or fourth time that this happens. Bill has a, I respect his point of view, but he's always, he doesn't wait for his turn. And well, Clara, then he's always Clara, 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 he's always me... threatening to he's going to leave, he's going to leave, he's going to leave. This is not going to be to 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 a place to live. This is a place to talk and to listen to each other, please. Clara, I mean it's okay. I, I respect you. you. Okay, I hear you, you, professor. Let Thank me you, let me just say you also came in early, and that's fine. I let that happen when I think that are they are relevant conversations, and I'm trying to balance that. Um, I think the the, 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 the questions Bill are, are raising are absolutely essential. And I have great respect for his willingness to raise Me them. too, but what I don't like is the threatening, the threatening. Okay. Bill is always threatening us. I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave, I'm going to leave. We don't want you to leave, Bill. We already say, we don't want you to leave. Don't leave, How do you speak us. to Native Americans without a land acknowledgement these days? Right. How do you speak to land no, Native all, Americans without well, a land can acknowledgement? Can I, can I say something? Uh, I never speak. Um, who's that? Sorry, my name is Holland. Hi, Holland. Hi. Um, I would like to address Phil's comment in that I actually think that is a misread of Arendt. I feel like what she is actually saying is in no way accepting of the enslavement of people. She is trying to understand how the Greeks felt that freedom functioned. And she is saying that it functioned only on the backs of others. She is not saying that that is a good thing. She is not saying that that is what she recommends. She is saying we need to understand how this function that's very similar to Eduardo Galeano's 500 years of, of looking at like the history of economy and the way in which poverty, um, that wealth required poverty. He is not saying that wealth should require poverty. He's saying that that's how it acted. And I think that's really important to see that difference and no, I think she's really saying this is terrible and this is very wrong, right? In Origins of Totalitarianism, she's looking at the structures that enabled totalitarianism to rise, that enabled anti-Semitism to rise, that enabled the Holocaust to occur, right? She's never saying that those things are good. She's saying, let us look at the and systemic I, and, I, and structural how, how systems are we talking that happen. No, I'm just- How are can we I, talking? How are we talking? No. This is not, and that's why I'm asking Roger, are we talking about the Greeks, Hannah Arlitz? Are we talking about us? All right, Bill, I, I, I think we're talking about Hannah Arendt, who is trying to talk about freedom and equality. And to do so, she says, there was an idea of freedom and equality brought into the world by the Greeks. Um, it's based on a pre-political violence. As Holland says, she doesn't like that. It's not like she says, therefore, we should always have justified political pre political violence. But what she is saying is we have to at least acknowledge it and we have to figure out 
what would it mean to have freedom um, today? Is there a way to, to, to talk about freedom? And if not, do we have to give up on the idea of freedom? That's, I think, the kind of question she's raising. Um, and, uh, you know, I've tried to say, I think that, um, you know, she, she understands that I mean, I, I, she, she definitely understands. She says it very clearly. There's no way we're going back to the Greeks. Um, she also very much understands that, uh, this is not part of this book, but in On Revolution, that the, uh, the idea of American freedom was also based on um, horrific crimes and, 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 and sins. Um, and her question is, um, okay, how do we understand this? And how do we uh, think about what it means to be free, given that. Um, are there other people who want to jump in on this? I want to let other people in if there are other people who want to participate in this, this particular discussion before we move on the list. If, you have, if, if, if not, I'll go on. But if people want to jump in, let me know. I just want to jump in and say that I feel Bill is asking you to start with a conclusion, whereas I think we're trying to start with first understanding what she's saying, and then we come to our conclusions, whether it's the same as Rogers or not. So I feel that that's... Oh, I, I don't know if I agree, Susan. This is Ben Holmes. I, I think... Can, my, can, everyone my, mute, can everyone mute themselves? I don't know who's... I, I'm hearing a background noise. Sorry, I, I'll just try to speak quickly. You'll probably hear some from me. Is If it's too bad, I'll just uh, type it in chat. Go ahead. Okay. Go ahead, Ben. Uh, I, I, Bill, please correct me if I'm wrong, but my read is I, I think he's concerned about a kind of loss of the reality of what we're speaking about in kind of the shuffle. Like Hannah Arendt moves between speaking of the Greeks, speaking of the present day, speaking of America, and there's, there's a kind of tendency to sort of wash out the comparative dynamics of these societies and who we are and who we're speaking to, the kind of reduce the actual lived history of what we have as a country into um, broad historical contexts and sort of sort of you know near platonic concepts in which we might say and, and that can lead us to a conclusion where we're like yes you know things things were bad I suppose but let's you know let's consider the abstract quantity of freedom and the ability to speak and it, it, that that can allow for a very kind of sanitized conversation. And I, I think some of the emotion that's coming out from that, which I, I'm very grateful for, is, is you know, uh, s something that we want to not lose, that maybe it's possible, particularly from my point of view, and I assume others here, you know, I'm, I'm a white male brought up in this country, it might be easy for me to lose some of the, like, to, to lose that context and to start, start speaking too much in general. And, and that while this is, you know, I'm sure there are technical problems in here, there are also historical problems and personal problems that can get easily lost in the shuffle. So that's, that's where I appreciate uh, hearing from it. But I, again, I think you're doing a, a good job of trying to talk about that too, Roger. So I'm somewhere in the middle of this. Look, I think, I think that's a great point. I go, both you and Susan brought up good points. And, you know, I think Bill and I are having, trying to have this conversation. It's a hard conversation to have with slightly different um, personal means uh, and, um, you know, moods. Um, and I, and I do, and, and because I recognize the limitations of my, in Ben's word, overly intellectual approach, um, you know, I really respect uh, people who challenge me on that. Um, uh, I don't think- uh, Roger, I don't want to, let, can I speak one more time? Let me try to make myself clear so I don't dominate and people hate me. If you were speaking to Native American people right now, anybody who cares about trying to make social change, you do a land acknowledgement and say that we're already standing on a, on a contradiction. Well, we, I did. Bill, I said. I said. I said we have a genocide, and we. I mean. No. I mean, okay. No. No. That's not my point. We're, we're, we're all. We're all over the world. There's. There's people from 15 or 20 countries here. I'm. I'm not sure. For, I mean, I have my own problems with formal land acknowledgments, and that I think they've become 
I think they become, you know, uh, I think they become like a, a formula rather than meaningful. It's my own view. People can disagree with me. Roger, I'm not it, asking for a landing. I'm using it as an example of how we talk philosophy or anything that has to do with the great and lofty principles of freedom and so on. We are sitting in a country right now that is practically become a fascistic state. How did that happen? Can we on this call acknowledge up front that Hannah Arendt did not have the benefit of what we have benefit of now, the long view of who we really are and what our traditions really are. That's all I'm trying to say. And we should have done that when we did the first day of talking about the book to free her up. This is not Holland, I'm not attacking Hannah Arendt. I'm saying there's something about what we're doing which is sloppy and, and not really morally, morally responsible. The last gentleman was coming close to it that's all I want to say. I don't want to bully anymore. It is too painful to be in this room. Do you understand what I'm saying? It's painful to be in this room. And that and and, and I'm not just threatening to leave. I Can have to leave because I feel like I, I can't be heard. I have no voice. Why is it painful? Uh, I, I, I understand. Let me let me jump answer, into hold on. Guys, if you I'm don't gonna, know the answer to that, that's pathetic. Yeah, I'm gonna exert some 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 control here. I mean, I think we can't ask people to explain the pain. I think if you, I think we should all listen to each other, right? And um, uh, you know, I listened, I listened to all of you, I listened to Bill. I I don't think uh, you know, we're living in a fascistic country. I think there's a lot of problems in this country. Um, I'm trying to think through the problems through one particular guide, Hannah Arendt. That's, um, you know, it's not an adequate way to go through life. If this were all I were doing, um, we'd all have problems. I'd have problems. Um, but I, I believe that she's a, a, a worthwhile guide to think deeply about the problems of our time. And, uh, and that's the, the premise here. Um, and I agree, Roger, but what about white supremacy? Uh, look, I, I, Bill, I, I think we, we can have a conversation about white supremacy. Oh, then I have to leave, Roger. That answer is so lacking. It's like you're telling Native American people, we'll talk about the fact that your land was stolen at another point. I'm saying we have no right to talk as, we, as if we are free people. We have no right. We are not. I, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not just storming out. But I don't, I don't know how to talk. I don't know how to talk. Well, then you got to learn how to. You well, need more uh, black can, can, people. I, I agree. I, I feel, Bill, um, not pain, but I felt very uncomfortable through this, uh, for similar reason, that it is very, uh, that the moral aspect here is not, is, is kind of washed out. And um, racism, which anti-Semitism anti is part of it, is so painful that the intellectual way that Hannah Arendt addresses everything. I mean, this is what made her a persona non grata in Israel when she was, um, when she was abstracting the Eichmann trial into the banality of evil, which she is right. She's absolutely showing how a whole machine rather than an individual um, are the focus of, of attention and evil here. But, but you know, uh, it is very difficult to hear the way that she discusses the dichotomy between freedom and meaning uh, in terms of a certain class of people, a certain category of people will have to be, had to be, uh, she talks about Greece, but she is not, unless uh, I'm missing something, not critically attacking the whole concept of nation, of a nation. Nation does not exist as, as, as it is a concept 
that is a wishy-washy of, of a lot of different things, mostly racism, um, religion, and again, take, take the, the uh, uh, Germany uh, during the Third Reich, the Jews were combined into a nation at the time, right? What nation? They were Orthodox Jews, they were atheist Jews, they were some Marxists, some revisionists, all kind. What, what is a nation? And But a nation has the strengths more than a cultural pluralism. If, if, if we agreed that we are a pluralist, pluralistic diversity, combine of people who have different beliefs and, and, and different habits and, and uh, different genders, different sexual orientation. I mean, that's including the state. Everybody is an equal citizen regardless. But when we define a whole category as a nation, it's almost giving it the power of more than a state, there is something above it. And uh, I think that's a real, real problem that allowed, that allowed uh, slavery and allowed persecution and, and all the other evils. And, and I wish Hannah Arendt would address it and maybe more from the gut level. Um, and as far as fascism, fascism is, is a dynamic concept. It changes these guys. Today, they force the powers that, that are um, pushing the machine on us or, or, or society are not the, the military force that was used, let's say, in the time, uh, in, in, in Mussolini time. Yeah. It is the PR and the rhetorics. And that's another thing that she doesn't, I wish she would discuss the dangers in rhetoric. Well, she does. I, I, I mean, I, I think that, uh, I mean, this is actually what I'm currently most interested in, Arendt, is her, her discussions about public relations and about um, the rhetoric of, of, of problem solvers and experts. Um, and she talks about these in a number of essays uh, in the late uh, 60s and early 70s. And, um, and so I think you're right that those are the, that she sees that as the real danger to, to the country right now. Um, I'm gonna bring us back to the list. Um, I'm sure this will come up again. I, I'd want it to, I'm not trying to, uh, to cut off this discussion. But let's go through the list and um, let people uh, bring up this and, and other topics. Hal, you're next. If you're here. Uh, sorry, no, 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 I am here. I just needed to, uh, I just needed to uh, unmute. No, my question is really, what are the differences? I actually attended, uh, the Bard College was having an open seminar last night. And it was something on the, uh, on the, that ode to man and Antigone. What is the controversy about the version that Arendt uses and how would that matter in terms of the way that human humanity is defined? Because on one hand, and I think this relates to one of the other just subjects of this as a whole, which is that Arendt seems to have a really ambiguous relationship with these Greek thinkers where she both appreciates what they have to say, but at the same time, she probably isn't literally advocating for just duplicating this Greek method, nor is she just nostalgic and saying, well, we have to, we should go back to that age just because it's both technologically not possible and on the level like we live in societies that are much larger and she doesn't seem to be advocating for mass slavery either. At the same time, it doesn't seem like she'd be for or she wouldn't see it as a political question, economic solutions such as a universal basic income or something like that to the idea of people living uh, in, air, in ways which they could be free. From what it sounds like today, it seems like you were saying she basically would basically assume that Americans would have kind of a minimal standard of living, or she experienced an era when most Americans experienced kind of a standard of living that would allow them to be free, even if the, they weren't like literally not doing any work. Um, yeah, thanks, Kyle. I, you know, I, again, this is not something she wrote a lot about. Um, 
1974 in this conference on her work, she was asked about it. And then, you know, in a, in a speaking engagement, she sort of said something like questions of housing and things are technical things. Everyone should have a house. Everyone should have a place to live. Um, but that's to her mind in a rich country, something that should just be done and is, is, um, is sort of like she assumed it was the obvious answer. Uh, she didn't think that's what um, the, 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 the political realm was about. Um, the problem is, as we've all seen, is that when we don't have a technical solution, um, then the political realm has to be about that. Um, and, uh, and I don't think she would disagree with that, um, although I don't know, uh, but I think she would say that uh, we shouldn't have to, we should, we should, I think, you know, she was a social Democrat in some way. I mean, she thought everyone should have a house and everyone should have food. And, and she thought that was simply a, a matter at this point of, 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 of technical uh, issues, whether she was wrong about that, of course, is very possible. Um, on, on the, you know, on the translation um, issue, I, I don't have it all in front of me. I mean, the, she translates the Antigone as great words paying back great blows of the overproud teach understanding in old age. The Hodelin um, translation, which she says is the only one who gets a sense of it, um, doesn't actually say great words. She talks about grossa blicka, uh, so great flashes of insight, um, um, uh, which pay back, vergelten, which pay back the the strikes of the and Schulten, the um, the strikes of the of the big shoulder, the gods, um, um, uh, teach to think in old age. Um, um, you know what she's. I, the I've I've heard that both she and Holden don't translate this the way most people do. I haven't gone back and looked at the Greek. Um, but what they're aiming at here um, is that uh, um, those who speak and those who persuade and those who offer great visions um, uh, um, can make us think and can give meaning to go back to the original comment uh, from Susan Wright earlier and provide um, meaning and 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 uh reconciliation um in the world and understanding um so that's how um i think she that's why she 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 brings up these 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 older greek texts um you know uh yeah i'll leave it at that for now um i'm sure it'll come up again stephen thanks roger thanks for navigating uh just one thing about uh, section four uh, and the idea of social companionship. Uh, I realize that Arendt is uh, explicating uh, Plato and Aristotle on those pages more than saying what she thinks, but was it, is it possible that something was lost in the firm demarcation between the household and the world of politics? I guess my point is that I think that the, the world of the household and uh, in general, uh, would be a, a place where we learn things like caring and a form of love. Whereas in the political world, we're not very likely to learn those. And yet we need something like that to make any kind of reasonable social justice work. I think that, I guess that the, the household in Arendt's view seems to be mainly a repository of, of a kind of tyr a possible tyranny, a lot of uh, housekeeping, literally, or bookkeeping, and maybe paternalism, and not much else. But I'm wondering if there isn't something else lost in the shuffle here that uh, love and caring are uh, embedded in, in, in households too, to, to an extent, and uh, would be useful to nourish the political world, even if the political world has to be treated analytically separate from that. Yeah. Thanks, Stephen. Um, yeah, she she does talk later in this chapter, I think in section 10, about love and goodness. Um, 
and say that they can't be part of the political world. Um, um, and so um, she has a, a strong sense that um, love uh, separates us from the world. Um, and that uh, when two people are in love, they are so caught up in each other that they lose the world. Um, and uh, what brings them back into the world, and in her view, what ends love, are children. Um, so really, I mean, we can talk about it when we get there. Um, uh, um, but uh, you're, there's no doubt that uh, there are more human activities than speech and action, and even about and freedom and, and necessity. And uh, they are uh, different, and there are different places for them in her mind, um, whether they should be in the public, social, or private. Um, you know, I think I think you raised this, and it comes back to this question that we've been discussing. And to me, it is, uh, you know, to me, it's the driving question of this part of her book and work, which is, I think she is arguing to some degree, as I think Bill is asking us to say, that freedom is a, um, a um, well, I mean, I'll put it in her words first, right? That freedom is based on um, uh, unfreedom and the, the, and, and the, and the uh, either the enslavement or the violent compulsion of others. I think another way to say that is freedom is based in injustice in our modern language. Um, and that raises the question of, is freedom a worthwhile idea? Right? Um, you know, I think she clearly believes in freedom, right? She thinks it's tied to meaning. It's tied to, uh, you know, it's what makes humans human along with meaningfulness. Um, and yet she is deeply aware of the ways freedom is tied to injustice and oppression. Um, and I think a big part of this book is, you know, is freedom something worth fighting for? And if so, are there other ways to think about it? Um, uh, and so, um, uh, you know, if freedom is not going to be, if we're not going to have a pure public realm and a pure private realm, and if more and more of the world is going to be social, Right? Do we have to stop thinking about freedom as freedom from need and start thinking about freedom um, in a social sense, maybe, which is, you know, how um, more and more social justice economists would think about freedom today yeah. or social justice uh, advocates for gender or race or, 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 or other oppressions? And I think that's an open question in this book. I don't think she answers it at all. Um, Maybe she should articulate it more clearly, um, but I think we are, and with all of our help, and I think that's helpful. Um, Emily. Hi. Okay. Um, my question's a little bit uh, maybe off topic. I'll, sh I'll offer it, and, but I don't know that it's it. Uh, we've moved on, I think, in the discussion, so I'll offer it anyway. So um, I, I work in performance studies. My, my concern with the rent um, comes from the notion of what it is to speak in the public, what it is to make public. Um, and um, I, I was really interested and I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about a, a, something she says on page 26, which she says, um, most political action insofar as it remains outside the sphere of violence is indeed transacted in words, but more fundamentally that finding the right words at the right moment, quite apart from the information or communication that they may convey as action. And for me, that's incredibly interesting because um, together with Lena, who's also here, Lena Shimich, we, we are arguing that, that maternal performance, that performance by mother artists who bring their domestic into the public realm by making performance art from it and with it, are making a, a political action. 
by by bringing the domestic into the public and um i'm just i'm really interested to to talk more about that notion of bringing the domestic into the public and, and thus making making action through making performance action which to me seems the most considered one of the most considered ways of choosing the right words and making them public is to put them on stage in front of an audience or um uh, but but then I'm also a, a bit stuck. I don't know if that's not, I don't know whether we can construe that as action in an Orentian sense. That's what I'm trying to wrestle with because she puts works of arts in, in a different category. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to, I'm trying to wrestle with that in my reading of her, but I, I'm not sure today is the day to discuss it. So I'm really happy if you want to just move. Well, I'll, I'll say something about it. Obviously we'll talk much more about it when we talk about the section on the work of art. Um, which is the last um, section of the chapter on work and thus the transition yeah. to the chapter on action. And um, just saying it that way, Emily should, should at least give you part of the answer, which is that for Arendt, um, artwork uh, um, is a kind of action for Arendt. Uh, insofar as um, uh, the artist in a work of art um, puts a work into the world um, in order for it to uh, be seen and heard. Um, that is a kind of action as she understands it. Uh, yeah, if we, if we have time, I, the, what I'm really interested in is the work that I'm looking at is work that is based in what might be construed as life work in performance art terms. So work where you exhibit your domestic, your daily, where that's the basis of your of your making of art, um, which for me complicates that rather. So life work. Sorry, that's a term from performance studies, but it, the idea that, so we're looking particularly at art made by artists who are using their maternal conditions, right. maternal experience. So the classic one is Mary Kelly exhibiting her child, her her mothering of her child for the first several years of their life, including things like dirty nappies. Um, so, so yeah, I mean, you know, this is um, this is a question that I think is 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 important. We've had a number of events or conferences on this question at the RN Center over the years. Um, you know, we had a whole conference on privacy, um, uh, in which this was a a major theme. Um, you know. To what extent, um, on the one hand, clearly a major uh, a major trend of politics in the last century, and certainly in the last fifty or sixty years, has been the um, uh, feminist insistence that the personal or the private is political, um, and and to that extent uh, to claim. Um, uh, that uh, you need to um, uh, uh, you need to uh, interrogate um, uh, private relations uh, in order to show their um, political oppressiveness, mm -hmm. um, uh, and and so that has clearly been uh, an important aspect of of, of political art um, and a political not just art but activism and, and speech and, and politics in general. Um, you know, uh, to the extent that in doing so, um, we uh, um, uh, do away with or limit, or in some ways impoverish a, a private realm in which um, uh, people can um, grow as unique individuals, um, you know, there's a cost to that. Uh, and Arendt is going to make you aware of that cost. Um, but again, she doesn't decide the issue. Um, you know, um, uh, that, that's the, that's the, that's the, that's what she's going to do is she's going to try and make you aware of that cost. Thank you. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, Susan Oberman, have you already, did you, I know you spoke once, do you want to, do you still have something you want to say? Yes, I just wanted to talk about um, something you said in the beginning um, about the nation state becoming a shepherd 
and based on caring for people. And I'm really not sure where that's coming from, since my understanding is the nation state actually was created out of enormous violence, uh, the Inquisition, and then um, the witch hunts. So um, they created a nation by eradicating uh, people who they felt were not desirable. Uh, so where is that shepherding and caring idea coming from? Well, okay, on the one hand, the, the shepherd language comes from not Hannah Arendt. It comes from Michel Foucault, who um, in his thinking about these questions actually is quite close to Hannah Arendt in, in some ways. So um, in one of his essays, on, I think it's on political, his essay on political economy. Um, I, I don't, I'm not positive. I'd, it's been a while since I've worked on this question. Um, he makes this distinction between two modes of governance, kingly governance, in which the king is quite high and separated from the people and, um, and, and, and sort of inspires them, but doesn't sort of care for them versus a shepherd who has to care for each sheep and take care of each sheep. And he says that the rise of political economy, um, government has moved into a, what he calls a pastoral mode instead of a, instead of a kingly mode. Um, Arendt here in these pages makes, I think, a similar argument, and she, it's not the only place she makes it, which is to say that the rise of Volkswirtschaft, of national economy, um, are, um, increasingly sees government as about taking care of um, the nation uh, and the people of the nation. Um, and uh, in doing so, um, uh, commits itself to a kind of pastoral um, caring uh, relationship as opposed to um, one that, uh, you know, is more um, distant. Now, I mean, again, I don't think she's saying we should go, I don't think there's any indication that she doesn't like that um, or that we should go away from that. What she does say is that um, uh, there is a contradiction between the nation state pastoral, the nation pastoral element and the state the statist legal element, which would treat everybody equally. Um, and uh, and she, she, she makes us aware of that. And that insofar as the nation state blurs these distinctions between um, uh, public and private, um, uh, you know, we, we increasingly live without a, a strong public world or a private world. Um, that's the argument here. Um, uh, and, um, on that level, I think she's right, you know, whether we, whether she should take a position on it, uh, you know, as, as we've been talking about is a different question. She here doesn't take a strong position, um, except to say that, um, insofar as we're moving to, uh, erase this difference, we are challenging, um, freedom as it's been understood. Uh, um, uh, you know, and human freedom and thus human meaningfulness as it's been understood. And as she thinks, I think, although she never says it per se, I think she thinks it's been understood in a valuable way. Um, she doesn't say that, so maybe not. Um, uh, but she does think we are in the process of um, radically transforming uh, the human condition. And in doing so, um, uh, transforming our, the idea of freedom that we've had. And she thinks we should at least think about it, think what we are doing. That's how I read it. Okay. Um, John. John Stern. Yeah, thank you. Roger, on page 31, she makes the quote halfway down. Its sentence begins with because, because all human beings are subject to necessity, they are entitled to violence towards others. Yeah. And I understand what she's saying, 
but the word entitled for me, if that's the correct translation, implies totally something quite contrary to um, we're hardwired, we're inclined, but entitled means there's a permission, permission granted because you're human, you're entitled to be violent. And when that word for me almost contradicts everything I read as regard to plurality, as regards towards love that she tries to opine on. So can you help me out here? Well, first of all, and, and this goes to, I think, a point where I do really agree with Bill, um, that at times she doesn't distinguish herself enough from the Greeks. But in this paragraph, she's talking about the Greeks, right? She says what all Greek philosophers took for granted. Um, this, is, this is her claim about how the Greeks understood this. Um, because all human beings are subject to necessity, they are entitled to violence toward others. And the Greeks justified um, slavery on those grounds. Now, not the kind of slavery we have, but, but at least slavery. Uh, certainly, violence is a pre-political act. Um, uh, uh, again, um, um, you know, I think it's a, it's a question, and it's a good question, of to what extent, um, you know, what's her reaction to that? And I take Ayala's point that, you know, on one level, you know, clearly uh, she is not, you know, she is not out here trying to, in any way, wanting to justify pre-political violence. Um, uh, I don't think that's her view at all. Uh, I, but I, I do think, and this is maybe Bill's point, she's, she's a bit uh, distant in saying, look, this is how it's been. Um, you know, it's not how it is now and it's not how we want it to be, but she doesn't then say everything is worth, you know, she does, and Bill's saying, shouldn't we throw out freedom and throw out all these ideas because they're embedded in a system of violence not white supremacy here because these weren't white versus unwhite, but but um, of pre-political violence. Um, and, you know, I think her reaction would be no. I mean, we have to think it through. We should realize that today we, we don't think that way, um, but she doesn't have that kind of uh, desire to, to, to um, I don't know what the right word is, but to say that because it came out of this, it's necessarily uh, um, toxic. Uh, and, you know, she may be wrong. I, I, I don't know. I, I honestly, I say that, I mean, I, I don't that's know. That's not my confusion. And, 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 and maybe my, and, and to be defensive, it may be my misreading. What I'm trying to understand is she's saying, or, this is the Greeks believe that man is entitled to violence. Is Hannah Arendt posturing that man is entitled to violence also, or is she rejecting? What, I, what I'm saying, John, is I, I I I don't think she's saying that man is entitled to violence. I don't know, to be honest with you. I mean, if you read her essay on violence, she will say that. You know, we we need to we need to move from thinking about violence to power, and I think that's where her own uh, thinking lies. So I don't think she thinks man is entitled to violence, um, but I but I do think she thought that's how the Greeks felt, and okay. I think she probably thought that's how um, the Americans felt. Uh, uh, you know, certainly up until um, probably the 1950s or 60s. And, you know, and then I think it's an open question of whether you think that they still feel that way. Um, but uh, I think she felt that way. I think she felt the Americans felt that way, um, at least up until the 1950s or 60s. Um, I don't know uh, her view after that. Um, well, quick, 
quick comment on this point. Yeah. Who's that? Kevin? No. Yes. Yeah. Yes. So isn't part of what she's up to there is to try to distinguish the fact that in this sort of private realm, the Greeks think you're entitled to violence, but in the public realm, in the realm of freedom, violence is not a part of that, right? That, that, that words are used in place of violence and that that's sort of what she's trying to recover. Absolutely, Kevin. But the problem that you know, we're, we're confronting and that she's confronting is that there's never been a public realm that didn't base itself on a prior uh, pre-political violence. And so you're right. Um, the, the hope is to create a public realm free from violence that also uh, undoes any pre-political violence. But, um, you know, that's a tall order, to say the least. And, um, but you're right, that's, you know, on her, at her most utopian, that's where she would be. Um, but uh, I don't know that I read her in that utopian way. Um, okay, I, don't think of, I don't think of her as someone who's naive in that way. I mean, naive, I don't... I don't mean, I'm not trying to say your position is naive at all. I'm, what I'm trying to say is, I think she is hard headed enough to sit there and say, look, folks, the very idea of freedom that we all love is based on a dark underbelly. And, the res and one result is that we are moving away from and losing that idea of freedom. And, you know, we need to think about it. And I keep saying that, and I hope that's not seen as, a, as an escape, although some of you may see it as an escape. I, I don't think she um, uh, has answers to these questions. I don't think she writes from the perspective of, here's what we should be doing. I don't think she knows. That's my own reading of Hannah Arendt. But the point, the point of being entitled um, justifies um, January 6th. Well, this, she's talking about the Greeks, John. I mean... No, but... no, I understand that. I get that. But the point is, I, if, it's, if, if she's only speaking as regards to the Greeks, fine. I get that. That makes it very clear. But if we're trying to finesse that she maybe didn't think that or she did think that or we're in that then what you have, it, it, it seems to me, it negates everything else. I could say that we're inclined, where we're, we're, we, we have a, a, an inclination for violence, the species, and I, that, that's a lot clearer to me. But to say that I have an entitlement for um, um, violence, it just doesn't, um, she either accepts that or she, rejects it. And I don't hear, I, I hear that, well, she's talking about the Greeks, but that doesn't, I'm trying to understand, did she say that? Does she handle no. that? Is she, this, she's she's coming clean. Clearly, clearly she doesn't think there's an entitlement to violence. I mean, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why, I don't know how it would be seen that way, but I mean, she certainly thought that the violence that she saw in the American Republic, she called the original sin and of the of the republic, she just certainly didn't think it was entitled. Um, uh, certainly, what happened to the Jews, uh, she didn't think was entitled. Um, no, I, I don't. I don't think I would. I'm pretty darn sure that she doesn't I, think that there's I, an entitlement. It's my, to this it's my misreading of the paragraph. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, Klaus. Hey, Roger. Um, thanks for that, and thanks to everyone for really interesting discussion. I want to pick up something, uh, both um, some of the points that um, Bill made, if I understood uh, correctly, and also that Stephen made, where on the one hand, I think that Aaron actually, which is also what you just said, exposes the, um, the actual cost of freedom. And, uh, you know, being a, a white European, I sort of grew up in a world where you could pretend like 
um, freedom, you know, you could enjoy uh, enjoy freedom and me and my sort of uh, ancestors have done in a long time, but I think it sort of becomes quite clear that um, it becomes evident quickly that, uh, that that is at the cost of a lot of people and that's still the case today. Um, and one of the things that I think is sort of curious and what's being picked up here is that what, you're, what you just said, which was, you know, Arendt doesn't necessarily have an answer to, you know, answers to these questions. How do we solve? How do we make a new, uh, a new place that that's that that enables this freedom? And on the one hand, I think that's sort of fine. You don't have to have answers to everything. But on the other hand, she seems to reject a lot of, you know, ways to try to solve this. And what I think she objects against in this book is that we make the the private, you know, the survival of the species and so on, our primary public concern, which is we're going to read, I guess, next time and the, the time after. But, um, and, and I understand why she rejects that. But what I don't understand, and this is also what Stephen said when she just sort of makes this sharp distinction between what is public and what is private, if something falls through the cracks. And it seems to me that um, what several people have pointed out is that uh, maybe there is a way to address maybe this is exactly what is needed to save the public is that we need to address how uh, how you can um, how we can solve these necessities together um, in a way where no one is sort of ruling over someone else even if that's an imperfect system with redistribution of wealth or whatever the case may be um, but that the goal of our common world is then not further survival or acquisition of further wealth or whatever the case may be, but rather this political, you know, this political being that she calls uh, or way of being that she calls action. And, and so I, I accept that she doesn't offer answers to this, but what I would like to hear your opinion on is why is she so hesitant to, to, um, you know, address how we find common solutions for this. And I think it speaks to a broader point and then I'll stop. It speaks to a broader point that on the one hand, you know, she talks about that labor can happen in solidarity and so can work. And on the face of it, yes, in the moment that may be true, but in, in all practical terms, that's not true. Um, because looking after like several fields, for instance, you know, sowing several fields and harvesting and so on has always been the job of many. Um, and the same with work. So yes, you may build a sculpture on your own, you may build a chair on your own, but all the, the pre-knowledge of building a chair, things that are either handed down or things that you're instructed with or the tools that you indeed use to build that chair are, is the consequence of humanity. And so I would like to understand those two things. First, why is she so hesitant to try and find common solution, even if they're pre-political to solve these necessity, these pre-political problems that then in turn can make politics, you know, possible for more people. And secondly, why, why does she seem to, to emphasize that um, the, the, the solidarity or the individuality of those two other activities of life when they are so blatantly um, in, in all practical terms, not um, individual? Thanks, Klaus. Um, so on the first question, you know, um, to some degree, I'm not sure anyone can answer that question for her. Um, you know, why did she do what she did and not other things? Um, you know, all I can say is um, she didn't see herself. I mean, as a citizen, she sought to answer those questions, right? She, she sought to um, vote and um, uh, certainly articulated a, what would be close to us, you know, a, a, a kind of social democratic platform in her letters and things of that sort. Um, she certainly believed uh, in, in, in the basic idea that more people should be brought into the public realm of freedom. I mean, I think that was um, one of her um, dominant ideas. I don't think she thought of herself as a political writer in that sense. Um, you know, she's not writing about that. She saw that as her views and she wanted to implement them. I think as a thinker, which is what she does in this world that we're engaged in, 
she's trying to articulate what's at stake. Um, and I hope, I think she thinks that people who read her would be inclined to um, articulate a, a vision that would bring more and more people into the world of freedom. Um, but, uh, but that for her is um, uh, uh, an opinion and one that, you know, we can agree or disagree with. And I think she would agree with it, but I, I don't know. And um, I mean, I think I, that's what I think she would agree with, but I, I don't think she would, I think she would say, that's not what I'm writing about. I'm writing about, um, you know, uh, what's at stake, what, 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 what these different changes mean. And then you guys have to uh, figure the rest out. Um, so, um, you know, uh, I can't really answer that question a hundred percent. Um, as for your, 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 your point about labor and, and work, you know, what she says, I'll just read it. It's on page 22. You know, the activity of labor does not need the presence of others, though a being laboring in complete solitude would not be human, but an anima laborans in the word's most literal significance, right? So if you plow a field by yourself, um, you're still laboring, but it's not human labor. It would be, you know, animalistic labor, building an anthill or, or I don't know what. Um, and man working and fabricating and building a world inhabited only by himself would still be a fabricator, though not homo faber. He would have lost a specifically human quality. You know, I think when I read this, I, I sort of push it to the side. And to that extent, I guess I would say, I think you're right, Klaus. Um, you know, I, 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 she's making a, a, a a very small or tight point, which is that, you know, while human labor is obviously needs a human world and human work needs um, uh, a human world, there is no action outside of humans. Now, you can't have action uh, outside of human world because it's based on a human world. That's her claim. Uh, you know, I think she's right, but, uh, you know, how important that is, you know, I would, I would say you're, you're right too, to say, well, I mean, okay, but why are we talking about non-human action and non-human work and non-human? She's just trying to make us aware of the special role action has in the Vita Activa and the maintaining of a meaningful human world. Um, Vigdis. Vigdis. Uh, yes, I had something uh, regarding to freedom and the possibility of freedom for all in old days. Uh, and I find her footnote on page 30, footnote 17, quite interesting, where she says that, that there were Greek cities where citizens were obliged by law to share the harvest and consume it in common, whereas each of them had the absolute uncontested property of his soil. And I think in that lies the uh, uh, thought of you have this property to live on. You have this. You have to have a space for to be a private person to go back to. But your harvest you should share with all. And in our days, I think this could possibly be realized to a great degree if we distributed wealth to guarantee that everyone has a basic income. So I, I'm in favor of some kind of basic income for all. And I read about uh, this, uh, for instance, from Guy Standing, who's an economist, English economist, uh, written a lot about the, the precariat. And um, he's also talking about preserving the commons, but that is something we don't do either. We privatize everything. And I think that is in our day something that will preclude the possibility for having this freedom for all. Yeah. No, I think that's a great point. Um, Aristotle in the politics says that there are diff three different modes of property regimes, right? There's, there's socialism where you know, no one owns anything 
and there's cap, you know, he doesn't use it called capitalism, but private property where, um, uh, you know, people own their property and, and the spoils of it. And then there's a third where property is um, uh, held in common, but for private use. Um, and, uh, um, and he says that's the best of the three. Um, interestingly enough, so there's a wonderful book about this called A Democracy of Distinction by Jill Frank. Um, and uh, if, um, if any of you are interested in it, uh, it's, a, it's, an, a, it's a great attempt to, to think about um, um, the way property laws uh, relate to democracy. Um, and uh, um, yeah, I'd highly recommend it. Um, but yes, I think, I think that some sort of uh, different way of understanding um, property, not communism or capitalism might be worth uh, thinking about. And that's sort of what Jill Frank does in her book, Democracy Distinction, based on Aristotle uh, and on this insight. Um, Kevin, do you already go? Kevin Finney? No, I, I mean, uh, that was just an aside earlier. I would like to take a minute if I can. Okay, um, quick, because I have to go at three and I got two more questions or one more at least. I don't know. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, so I want to return to this idea of thinking what we're doing. And it, it seems to me the way that I've sort of come to think about what a rent is doing is that she kind of thinks that, that we can't really think what we're doing from inside what we're doing, that, that going back to the Greeks is in part an effort to achieve a kind of contrast to what we're doing. Um, and that, you know, there's, there's two sort of sets of contexts for this for her. One is the tradition and the fact that the tradition has sort of diminished a notion of politics, except perhaps for Machiavelli. And, and then sort of where we are, and this is, she'll get more into this in the next section, section six, but um, the sort of social reality that we live in now in which, uh, you know, administration of things and a kind of Weberian bureaucratic rationality kind of come to dominate. And it's, it's in both of those contexts that the effort to recover, and we've talked a lot about freedom, but you know, it's, it's for me, it's always been more a notion of sort of politics that she's trying to recover that contrast with both of those realities in important ways. I have more to say about this, but keeping it brief, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Kevin. Um, yeah, I think politics and freedom clearly for her go together. Um, politics yeah. is about um, the free, uh, action of equal people uh, to make a meaningful world, which is what politics is. Um, uh, you know, why she returns to the Greeks, um, I think uh, I think it's a good good point, you know, and it's to it's a way in a way to get out of uh, you know what she sees as the current thinking um, and to see a contrast. It's not that the Greeks had it right and we have it wrong. It's, it's a way of, um, uh, you know, it's in, neat, in the Nietzschean sense, doing a genealogy, right? Doing a history of the present to show how ideas that we take for granted in the present came about through a series of translations and changes and to thus open up a way to free ourselves from the way current ideas um, uh, unconsciously dominate us. That doesn't mean we want to go back to what was prior. It's an attempt to open things up and, um, and to show that there are biases both for the Greeks, but also for us. And, uh, and, and that's part of her, her method. And it's not just the Greeks that she goes back to. Um, she goes back to wherever she thinks it's important and helpful to, to, to see something different. Um, 
uh, on the questions of freedom, she goes back to the Greeks because she thinks that's where something different uh, was. Um, you know, on questions of tradition, she'll go back to the Romans. Um, on questions of democracy, she'll go back to New England. You know, so she she has different places she goes back to. Um, none of them are saying that all those people were great or right, but that uh, they did things in ways that we don't do them that help us see uh, that what we are currently doing may have um, biases and, and uh, un, un, unaccounted uh, uh, impulses that we need to take uh, and understand. Um, Aldo. This will be the last question because I am running out of time. I thank you, Roger, and thank you to all for this space. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you uh, uh, maybe a basic questions about the matter of violence. And uh, what is violence for Hannah Arendt in your view? Uh, what is her understanding of violence is? Uh, I'm thinking about uh, if there can be in her view also violence in, in, a, in the pre-political intrinsic labor or functioning of the machines and robots. Uh, there can be, uh, can be this notion extended to, to animated things. That's yeah, I mean, so, you know, in this text, violence is um, uh, the use, the, the way, the use of force um, uh, that's not based in speech and, and, and action and persuasion. Um, in her essay on violence, right, where she gives it more direct uh, uh, consideration, um, uh, she'll say that violence is um, the use of tools and implements, um, uh, which could be swords or guns or robots, um, to uh, to achieve um, ends, um, and um, those ends could be just or unjust. Um, so for her, violence is uh, is to some degree neutral, um, but not fully, because uh, um, when violence is, um, what she says is that while violence can sometimes be uh, used to pursue justice, most of the time, it has the it has the impact not of pursuing justice but of leading to more violence, um, and and so what she says is that violence is one way to pursue social change, but power is another, and she thinks power is a more um, just and powerful way of um, pursuing social change than is violence. Um, but um, what violence is, is a very, is a kind of, she, she, she takes a very uh, uh, functionalist view of it. It's, it's simply uh, uh, the use of, of tools and implements to achieve means through force. Excuse me, uh, but um, I want to point to the, to the notion that there can be violence exerted to the things I don't mean to other people, but from people to animated things. Yeah, you can also use people as 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 implements, right? Soldiers or or. No, no, no. I mean, can be the the the, the things itself. I mean, uh, currently we are replacing the the labor for robots. I mean, could be the the robots, the modern slaves, to say something. It, it, it makes sense or. It doesn't. Uh, to I'm not. I, I, I so say it again, Aldo. I mean, so yes, robots can be modern slaves, but I mean, I don't. Are you asking is there violence against robots? Or I'm not sure I understand the question. <laughs> yeah, to say. It's, I mean, uh, uh, well, I, you know, I, I, I don't think. I mean, you, you, you know. Um. She makes a distinction between violence against the natural world and violence against other other human beings. Or mankind, um, I, I don't. I mean, I don't think she would. 
have a problem with violence against robots. I mean, if we start talking about sentient robots, you know, we're, we're getting to a point where I'd have to, I, I don't know. And I don't think she really ever thought about it. Um, if that's the question. Did I understand it? I'm not sure if I did. Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, we're, we're at three and I need to run, but um, thank you guys all. It was, uh, it's exciting as always, um, <laughs> but these are difficult topics and I don't have all the answers. I don't want it to, look, I, I have to somewhat impose yeah. myself. I apologize, um, but um, I'm glad you're here and I'm enjoying talking with you and I'm learning a lot from all of you. And, um, you know, I, I have much to learn and I'm working on it, but um, thank you all. I hope you're continuing to enjoy reading Hannah Rent. And I think for next week, we're reading the next two chapters on the social and the public, two of the really meaty chapters of the book. So enjoy it and enjoy reading Hannah Rent. Thank you very much. Great.